basically for a couple months before I was about to do this speech. I've known about it, but every single time I've decided to sit down and write about it, I've gone blank and I always tell myself that, you know, whatever I'm going to say or my story and my journey isn't good enough. And I still sometimes, especially since I've been able to recover to where I am now, um, believe that I never had an eating disorder and that it was a lie. And um, so I was sitting in the cafeteria with my two best friends when we were studying for finals and I was taking a little bit of a break from that and sitting down to write this and I told the two of them that what I was feeling about writing it and they one my my best friend Josie looked at me and rolled her eyes and said how about you start out with the fact that if you cheered one more quarter longer in the game you would have died and that was a big a big thing for me um so basically I'm a college cheerleader and on October 10th of my sophomore year of college, 2015, I collapsed on the cheer field um, and I don't know exactly when my eating disorder started. It's kind of been like peeling the onion for me. Um, I thought it started, you know, college, high school and it just kept going back and it's like peeling an onion. The more that I grow in recovery, the more I realize that my life's been pretty much rooted in it. So I used to think my eating disorder um, started in college, but um, from as young as fourth grade, I had memories of standing in front of my mom's mirror and pinching my chubby body and hiding food in my napkin and sitting at the dining room table um, for hours, not allowed to leave until I finished the bite in my mouth. and I just would not do it um but in seventh grade was really when um like full-on eating disorder kind of appeared the one of the biggest memories that i have was my first day of seventh grade me and my best friend were split into separate homerooms and within the first like three hours before recess she found a new best friend um, and i remember running over to her when we got to recess thinking oh finally like i get to see lizzie and she looked at me with her new best friend and told me that I couldn't hang out with them because I was not their size. Um, so even to that day, like, it's just a painful memory. I, it was seventh grade, but it's still, like I can feel it in my gut still. Um, so through elementary and middle school, I dealt with body image issues and I was just generally shy and quiet. So definitely a candidate to be bullied um, physically and verbally. I mean, I was occasionally pushed into lockers, um, stuff like that, but it was really the girls laughing at me and being called fatty and porky and, you know, all that kind of stuff that really stuck with me even longer than I thought it did. So by the end of eighth grade for me, I started slimming down. I was playing volleyball. Um, and my brother and I generally just have the biology that we both were kind of chunkier in middle schoolers and slimmed down in high school. Um, but unfortunately for me, my natural body size is relatively petite, so it made that transformation amazing to people. Um, and all of a sudden, I went from being this kid that was shy and bullied and nobody wanted to hang out with her to being praised for my body and asked how I did it and I was instantly accepted and it no longer was based on who I was because I didn't change but it was just how I looked and how small I was and that really dug into my brain that my worth was based off of how I looked and the size that I was. Um, so then as I got into high school I was always in sport. I played volleyball cheerleading tennis, golf, and so I was constantly going. So it was a lot more exercise and my restriction kind of, you know, played on the back burner. My eating disorder was there, but I was into exercising. Um, I focused way too much on how I looked, um, put way too much energy into making sure that I was seen as tiny and really thought that was my identity. But you know, my eating disorder kept steady in high school because I had to be healthy enough for my physicals and, um, you know, keep going, eat dinner with my parents, that kind of 
of stuff. So it really started escalating when I graduated from high school and was no longer in these sports and decided that, you know, I had to do something because I wasn't working out every single day like I had been. So after high school graduation, my parents took me and my best friend to Hawaii for graduation present, which was amazing and one of the most fantastic weeks of my life. But I distinctly remember the last day, one of the last days, being on the beach in my swimsuit and just looking down at my stomach and feeling complete disgust for myself and my body. And it was like a switch and my head finally flipped and I promised myself that once I got home things would change. Um, so over that summer my eyes began running more and more and it escalated how much I liked that. I liked going to fitness classes and I was, you know, started calorie counting and doing that kind of stuff. And at first I loved the way that it made me feel. I loved um, just becoming more toned and that kind of stuff. And I wasn't really dropping much weight at that point. It was mostly just muscle and stuff like that. But then I went off my freshman year to Tufts University in Boston, um, which was a really good school. And I was excited that I got in, but also terrified because it was across the country. Um, and I was always worried that I wasn't good enough to have gotten in there and that I was going to fail out and all this kind of stuff. So when I got there, I was focused on two things. One, to not fail out of school, but two, to not gain freshman 15. I, that was like something that could not happen. Um, so with those two goals, exercise and going to the gym and calorie counting and all that kind of stuff became the thing that I could do and do well. And so during that fall semester, I was calorie counting like crazy. Um, I was going to the gym every day. It became my safety net because I was homesick. I was scared. I wanted to transfer back home and it was the only thing that was in my control, I felt. So I did that all freshman, fall semester, freshman year, and then over Christmas break, I decided to transfer to Carroll College closer to my home. And when I got there, I tried out and joined the cheer team, which I fell in love with completely. Um, but I, the idea of showing that I was worthy for my spot and especially coming in partway through the semester, it was a big deal for me to be the best flyer I could. And in my brain, that meant being the smallest flyer that I could. Um, and that's when I completely lost myself. I began skipping meals and working out even harder and counting calories even more. And my roommate had a scale and I was weighing myself multiple times a day. Um, I would set myself goal weights, but every single time I hit them, I wanted to go five pounds more and five pounds more. And it no longer was me trying to be healthy, it was me trying to get the number down on the scale. Um, and I dropped a decent amount of weight that semester. So then when the summer came, it escalated even further. I Then that was my life. My, I was back home for the summer. I was back at the gym that I have used all through high school. Um, and that was what I did. I was training for the marathon. So I was going to the gym two, three times a day. Um, and when it came time for the marathon, it was one of the moments that I'm like, oh my gosh, I, you know, did not take care of my body before the run. I only cared about the calories that I burnt during the race. During the race, I refused to let myself stop. I refused to let myself have water. I refused to let myself go to the bathroom because I felt like that would erase the success that I was going to have. And after the race, I didn't even allow myself to eat a piece of watermelon, which is ridiculous because I thought it would erase my success. And that was, that's a big moment for me realizing that even then I was like, something's weird here. But I still, you know, kept going. And at that point, I started getting messages on Facebook because there's pictures posted of me at the lake in a swimsuit and people were getting worried. Um, and I blew them off, mostly because I didn't want to give up what I was doing. 
and I let my brain tell me that they were jealous or that they just didn't understand. So that kept going. So as my sophomore year of college and cheerleading started, everything got stronger and stronger. I, the one thing that was keeping me going was being at home, having to eat dinner with my parents. Um, and when you go back to school, you're by yourself. So sophomore year started and restriction and laxative use became so strong that I didn't even have the energy to work out outside of cheerleading practices. Um, and the weight was just falling off. Every single morning, the only thing that got me out of bed was the excitement, I guess, of waking up and finding the scale in the bathroom and seeing how much weight I lost that day. And if it wasn't what I would claim as good enough, I wouldn't let myself eat that day. Um, I was not eating much at all. And um, I completely isolated. I shut out my friends. I had stopped focusing on school. I didn't have the energy to homework. I thought I hated school. I thought I wasn't smart enough to be in college, all this kind of stuff. And by the end, by the beginning of October, I hit bottom. Um, there was a Saturday, October 10th that I already mentioned that I went to cheer the football game and I could barely stand. Um, I fell over and almost passed out and my coach brought me to the side and gave me a granola bar and water and I looked at it and I couldn't do it. And I had realized that I hadn't eaten for days. I, and that one little granola bar I could not do. Um, so after that, I told my best friend, thinking that she didn't know, but everybody knew. Um, but I didn't think I was that bad. Um, so then I went to the hospital and was diagnosed with anorexia, orthorexia, and exercise obsession. And I was in the beginning of heart and kidney failure. And I was told that if I lived like this just a day longer or continued cheering that game, I would have died. And I was 19. Like, I hadn't even made it to my 20s. And my doctor looked at me and told me that my heart rate was lower than when they would put pacemakers in people. And I laughed. Um, which is crazy that I laughed at the fact that, like, I should have been dead. But at that point, Montana didn't know much about eating disorders. Um, so I was sent back to school contingent on seeing a dietitian and a therapist and being weighed by my school three times a week um, and I was a people pleaser so I wanted to do it this is my first time ever in recovery so I didn't really know what was ahead of me um, and after about a week and a half two weeks I fell into old habits and relapsed really hard um, which is when I went to the Emily program in Spokane to do an intake thinking I would just be IOP or something, you know, along those lines, but I was sent to the adolescent house, which is residential in Minnesota, ASAP, so I had to leave school. Um, so, my first round of treatment, I went to Minneapolis three days after I was in my intake, um, and the whole time I was there, I didn't think I needed it, I was compliant didn't think I was sick enough to be there and just wanted to do what I had to do to make it back for spring semester. Um, unfortunately, since I was compliant, my insurance also decided that I was not sick enough and I was sent to PHP earlier than my therapists were hoping. Um, I was also compliant in PHP in Spokane. I struggled, but I didn't deal with what was underneath my eating disorder. I had no idea. Um, so I went through the emotions, did whatever, and went back to school. A couple weeks later, I started in February, um, but I had not reached my healthy weight range. So the beginning weeks of that were all great, and I thought I was doing great in this little honeymoon phase, and all of a sudden, my weight was increasing and increasing, and it hit a point, my roommate had a scale, and I was delaying myself, it hit a point that it was no longer in the weight range that they thought that I would be in, and I lost it. I, it's like another switch flipped, and I went from being relatively compliant to acting like the worst I ever had in my eating disorder. 
Um, so when I went back for a follow-up in Spokane about a week later, my team was shocked and scared and gave me two weeks um, to get it together, basically, um, or I would have to go to a higher level of care. So I went back to school and I didn't even make it those two weeks. My dad called me about a week later on my 20th birthday, not to wish me happy birthday, but to tell me to pack my bags for residential. And I lost it, but I had to go back. Um, so I was back in PHP in Washington for about four weeks. I was devastated and angry. Um, and I mostly just did not want to eat. I was there and I was always boosting constantly. I cried more than I probably ever have. Um, and the staff, I loved the staff to death, but they they knew that I needed to be in higher level of care than they had. So they kept telling me or request, requiring, requesting it. Um, but they wanted it to be my choice because they thought that would do more. And I kept pushing it off and pushing it off because I didn't want to eat meals. Um, and I finally, at the beginning of my fourth week, I scared myself into realizing that I needed more help. Um, I had a fear of going back into treatment that next Monday because you have the weekends off. I overdosed on a random assortment of pills. Um, Hoping, I went to bed hoping that I wouldn't wake up in the morning. And I did. <laughs> Unfortunately. Thankfully. Um, and the next day was awful. I couldn't lift my head off of the pillows. I was in so much pain. It was awful. But that night, by the time the night hit, I was better hydrated and was able to go to the dining, dinner table in treatment and of course I didn't finish my meal so I was boosting with the dietitian at that point after the meal alone in the kitchen and I started crying and told her that something else had to happen I couldn't do it anymore I was sick of fighting myself nothing was changing it was my fourth week in a place that you're not supposed to boost and here I am boosting and I with assistance asked to go to residential so four days after that i was sent to cleveland ohio in residential here um i would have to go back to my dorm and pack up all my school stuff and go back to spokane and pack up that stuff and go to cleveland so i felt like i was packing up my whole entire life i was leaving everything i knew so when i got to cleveland i already regretted asking for help um I wanted nothing to do with residential. I regretted breaking down and all I wanted to do was get whatever I had to do there done and get back home so that I can go back to my behaviors that I had at home. Um, so I went into autopilot again and my first like week of residential as compliant didn't really talk to anybody. It was not myself. Like I think back about it, I'm like, oh, Luckily, there's some of them are here today still like me, but <laughs> but um, my therapist even joked around saying that she would rather have me slip up and grow from something than, you know, continue to be shut down but compliant and get nothing out of treatment. So it was a constant struggle for a while, but I did it. And then on my first pass of the weekend, on a weekend, I did not eat some of my food and when I got back I did not report to the nurses I lied because I was too afraid to boost for what I had missed and that started a ripple effect I the wall that I built up and the autopilot completely came crumbling down around me and everything that I tried to avoid dealing with I had to deal with and that was definitely it was the beginning of the hardest worst most pathetic weak moments in my life that's what I thought but they're now like the experiences that I'm the most proud of um so at that point I 
was having panic attacks just walking into the kitchen and I was hiding my independent snack and throwing them in the bushes and stuffing my granola bar down my yoga pants and it was bad. I was running from the kitchen when I was supposed to be boosting because I couldn't stand sitting in a room with food any longer. Um, but mostly I was lying to the staff that I love. I, they were my family at this point in my life and I was sitting there lying to their faces because of food, which was crazy. Um, but at that point I was in complete I don't know. I was completely resigned to being a chronic case because I had been told that I was, and here I was, relapsed and not even able to, you know, be in recovery in treatment. So I was telling people that recovery just, just wasn't for me. And I accepted that as my fate. And I remembered my doctor telling me when I first was diagnosed that I wouldn't make it to my 20s. And at least I made it to my 20th birthday and I was fine with that. Um, one night I had a like literal epiphany and whether you believe in spiritual or God or divine intervention or whatever, like that's the only way I can explain it. I can't do it justice. Um, I was sitting in a little nook in the residential and I had a granola bar that I was planning on hiding. I picked it hours before my snack because I knew how I was going to hide it, what I was going to say to the treatment team. Um, and I was sitting there on my phone, wasting time, before I went in and reported that I had finished the snack that I had not finished. And all of a sudden, it just hit me. And I looked down at this stupid little chewy granola bar, freaking like four bites of a granola bar. And I was like, what the hell? Like, I hate lying. I especially hate lying to people that I love, that I care about, that they care about me. And here I am sitting here with this chewy bar about to lie to them again. And I was like, that's ridiculous. Um, so like shaking out of anxiety and bawling my eyes out and wanting to run out of my body, I started opening the granola bar wrapping and that was a huge turning point for me. Um, that's one thing I've learned about myself in treatment, which is my therapist in Spokane's favorite thing to talk, say about me is that I'm bad at lying. I don't like it. It doesn't stay with me. I can't maintain it. And it's not the Cali that I want to be. It's absolutely not. It's my eating disorder and it's not me. Um, so for the next couple months, so I was discharged. For the next couple months, I went through excruciating pain, um, recovering and trying to do my best and setting goals and trying to align my values with what I was actually doing. And I decided that I, what I really wanted was to be a therapist or an EDT in this field. And I realized that the only way that I could truly do that and help other people is to take care of myself first, which sucks <laughs> at some points, but that's what's really kept me motivated. And I'm lucky that that's still what's driving me. So after I was discharged from Cleveland from residential, I went back to Spokane and did the step down process there, PHP, IOP, and I eventually returned to Carroll College for fall of 2016. I finished my first year a couple weeks ago. Um, I got a dog that I even named after the Emily program, Emmy, <laughs> and she reminds me just that her love for me isn't contingent on anything, which is huge, that her constant love and it inspires me to take care of myself every day and to love myself for who I am, even on my worst days. She doesn't care. She's over there too. <laughs> um, and then I also opened up to the public about my struggles um, in hopes that no one would feel as lonely as I did in my moments of despair and especially before I had started going to the doctor and talking to therapists and stuff like that and it has both warmed and broken my heart at the same time. The responses I got are huge. Everybody has struggles that they're dealing with um, and that's really been an honor for me to be able to at least talk or whine about our problems with each other. It's so helpful. Um, I began working as a nanny 
last summer for two freaking adorable little girls. Um, and I've been able to watch them since they like couldn't sit up to now they're running around like freaking wild women, um, grabbing everything they can do. And it has really been a great experience being able to, you know, see that and care for them and just see the joy in a little baby's eyes. It's great. Um, I cautiously returned to cheer in the winter after taking off the fall and honestly not thinking that I was ever going to go back, but it was my family and they had been through everything with me and I missed that and my coach was great. She welcomed me in um, just on a slow basis, gradually making sure that doing it was healthy and good for me and I loved it. Um, so basically, without really noticing it, I was surrounding myself with the people and the things that brought out the characteristics that I decided I valued for myself. Um, and I was able to care for others and act out of compassion and dance and goof off and smile and all the things that I want to do in the future, but you don't have to wait till the future to have these things. Um, I realized that having a healthy body and mind were what made me a better person and more energized caregiver. Um, it supplied me with the body that I need to take care of these adorable little babies that, you know, cling to my every limb. <laughs> I thrived on the little everyday differences that I could make merely by being myself instead of my eating disorder. My eating disorder was isolated in a bedroom, laying on a bed crying. My healthy self is laughing and hanging out with little kids and smiling, hopefully making somebody's day. I don't know. But yeah, that's huge for me. So in December, after I'd been commuting back and forth for outpatient stuff to the Spokane Emily program, I was officially discharged, graduated from the Emily program. Um, and then in March, I received an email from the whole institution out here after I had just shot in the dark in the fall, emailed a whole bunch of places about an internship just because I could not handle the fact that I had to wait two years to do what I loved. Um, and in March, she emailed me back and said she had something for me. And it's been phenomenal. I absolutely love it. Um, and then while writing this timeline, I've started to realize just how different everything in my life is within a year. I mean, on this day last year, I discharged from residential and had a lot of work ahead of me. And now I'm standing in front of a whole bunch of people, first of all, giving a speech, which I never would have done, but talking about my recovery, which not my eating disorder, but my recovery, which is crazy because I never ever thought that one, I would have a recovery story, but two, that I could share it with people, which is great. So a little bit of advice, I know I'm going over time. Um, the biggest advice I can give anyone going through something similar is that hitting rock bottom is nothing to be ashamed of. Um, it's where I learned the most important lessons and at rock bottom, I lost hope. And I realized that it's okay to let other people carry your hope for a little bit, um, but eventually, you have to work and dig deep and ask yourself where you want to be in a year, in five years, in ten years. And then you have to do something about it. Um, I knew that I could no longer lie to people. And I had to own the ugly truth that the person that I was being was not somebody that I was proud of. Um, and by no means does that mean it's an easy fix or a flip of a switch, but it gave me something to fall back on, especially on the hard days and it gave me a path to look forward to. Um, now when I have thoughts, I try to ask myself questions. Um, if I had an extra dessert last night hanging out with my friends, is that pushing me further or closer to my goals? If I have a hard day even in recovery and struggle, does that mean I'm no longer in recovery? No. So, I don't know, I think it's really important to allow yourself to have feelings without attacking yourself for them. Recovery is hard and it's 
not every day that's easy. I still have my days, but I've been able to find things that motivate me to keep me going even with those days. So last piece of advice, find what motivates you and go for it. My dreams by no means have been supported by everybody. A lot of times it's looked like I'm crazy, but I know in my heart that I care enough and want them enough that they're going to happen. Um, so that's, I don't know, that's the biggest thing for me. Just put one foot in front of the other and don't look down, don't let like a downward slide keep you from rising back up. If every day you wake up and you try to do the next right thing, you will eventually make it. Thanks.